Good afternoon and welcome to Fortress Press Live, where we connect you with the people and passions behind the books we publish here at Fortress Press. Our guest today is Mark Ellis, and we'll be talking about his book, Future the Prophetic, Israel's Ancient Wisdom Represented. Mark, thanks so much for being a part of this episode today of Fortress Press Live. Glad to be here. Take a few moments and introduce yourself to the Fortress Press Live audience. Well, uh, I've been around for a while, uh, born in North Miami Beach, Florida in the 1950s, grew up at a time when the Holocaust and Israel were background issues for Jews, went off to school, studied with uh, Richard Rubenstein, the, probably the first Holocaust theologian, wrote the cla- now classic After Auschwitz, worked among the poor, Catholic worker, Hope House in New Orleans. Then uh, did my PhD at Marquette and was recruited by Marinol to teach there, where I founded an Institute for Justice and Peace, taught there for 15 years, and then uh, taught at Baylor for almost 15 years as well, Baylor University in Texas, and now uh, sort of semi-retired. So I've been teaching and writing about the Holocaust, Jewish identity, Israel, Palestine for many years. Thank you for giving us a bit of introduction and into who you are and where you've been and where you are today. And as you mentioned, today we're talking about your new book, which is titled Future the Prophetic, Israel's Ancient Wisdom Represented, which released this past May from us here at Fortress Press. Now, one of the things you say in the introduction that I thought was kind of interesting, after the 1967 war, the Holocaust was named as the epitome of Jewish suffering. Israel is named as the response to that suffering. Ancient texts and the ancient Jewish gods were thrust into the background, and our immediate Jewish history took precedence. The remnants of the past that survived did so only in the wake of the drama of contemporary Jewish life. I'd be curious to hear from your perspective, what was the core of Jewish identity, say, before the war? And then how did that shift in the decades that followed? And what does that maybe look like today? Give us some perspective on that. Well, it's interesting, even if you take it from a personal level, I became a bar mitzvah in 1965, two years before the 67 war. And so my Jewish education was very much centered around the rabbinic tradition. The Holocaust was in the background. It hadn't quite yet been named. And we knew about Israel, but it was for us a small pioneering state in the Middle East. Neither were central. And most of our lives were trying to kind of balance being American and Jewish. But after the 67 war, even those who became bar mitzvah, you know, in 1968, 69, 70, there was a massive shift in Jewish identity where the Holocaust was named and Israel became central to Jewish identity, both of them together. So there was a huge shift in Jewish identity within the space of a few years, but it changed everything. Jewish life became much more assertive, a lot of pride around being Jewish, but also there was a militarization of Jewish identity. There was a toughness that was emphasized, and sometimes even a uh, bulliness. So there was a big shift, and that carried on through the 70s and 80s, and now there's another shift because Israel has become, during that time, so contentious, and that then reflects back on the lessons of the Holocaust. So. What were the lessons of the Holocaust? Never again to the Jewish people, yeah, I agree, but also never again to any people. And that never again to any people is becoming much more central to many Jews, what I call Jews of conscience, especially in relation to Israel that was originally seen by most Jews as innocent. Now Israel has become much more problematic and The war in Gaza right now, I mean, is just part of that question of what Israel is really about. Now, another thing that you talk about in the book, uh, you say that contemporary Jewish life is both flourishing and in a state of decline at the same time. Give us a little bit of perspective. What does that look like here in the United States and, and maybe other places in the world as well? Well, flourishing in terms of the sense of uh, being proud to be Jewish books being written by Jews and about Jews, Jews making it in America and, of course, in Israel. There's also that sea change from when I was a child to now in terms of the position of Jews in American society. For instance, when I was a child, there were quotas holding back the number of Jews at many universities, especially the top universities. Now many of those universities have Jewish presidents. And, of course, 
in the political realm, Jews are much more prominent. So we have a flourishing of Jewish life in many ways through achievement, through hard work, buoyed by our tradition, but we also have a decline, and I would say that decline is an ethical decline, where instead of using our newfound power for justice, we're often using it to hold others back and to oppress another people, uh, especially the Palestinian people. Now, obviously, the word prophetic is very prominent in the title of the book. Talk to us about how the prophetic fits into all of this. How does that tie into what you cover in the book? The prophetic is the indigenous of the people Israel. That's one of the claims that I make in the book, that at the center of what it means to be Jewish is the prophetic. And we are the only people in the world that have that as our center. Now, the prophetic has spread around the world, and often in part of our community, the prophetic is in steep decline. On the other hand, Jews of conscience are bringing the prophetic forward in an explosive way. So, from the beginning of Jewish history, one way of looking at that history is the exploration and embodiment of the prophetic among Jews and the struggle against the prophetic by Jews who think there's no way to live in the world by the prophetic. So you have the two. Without the prophetic, there's no reason to be Jewish. With the prophetic, we may not be able to survive. There's been a civil war in the Jewish world from the beginning, from the Bible, and you can see it very, very clearly today over the question of Israel. You mentioned this earlier, but obviously it's very difficult if we turn on the television or read the headlines. Almost every day we're hearing something about the conflicts that are raging right now in the Middle East. I'd be curious, from your perspective, what are some of the things that a Western audience, I suppose specifically those of us here in the United States, what are some of the things that we really need to understand in order to properly frame and grasp what we see happening around us in the world today? Well, the Middle East, of course, is a very complex uh, area of the world, like most areas of the world, Uh, and Israel is complex. It's hard to see Israel in a single focus. Jewish history is filled with suffering, with contribution, with struggle, with the prophetic, with empire. It's full of everything in life, sometimes in a very exaggerated way. And if we look at the history of Jews in Europe, Uh, especially in the 19th and 20th century, but before as well. One could certainly understand the desire of Jews to have their own place in the world, which became Israel. So that's one thing that people in the West need to know, that Jewish history, while complex, had a lot of suffering in it, especially in Europe, especially at the hands of Christians. And therefore, Israel is an understandable response, uh, Jews saying, hey, We need to have our own power, especially after the Holocaust. But the problem arises then that to create the state of Israel as a Jewish state, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were cleansed from Palestine to create Israel. And that expansion of the Jewish presence in Palestine, now Israel, has led to increased suffering among Palestinians, occupation, further displacement refugee status, invasion, and now in the Gaza war, one can see that uh, again close up. So, you know, I understand the desire among Jews to have a state of our own, but that state has become a belligerent bully oppressing another people, and that part of Israel needs to be stopped. Well, in the midst of peace talks, ceasefire agreements, and obviously continuing conflict, what are some of the possible movements or ways forward that you see? Well, the easiest one or the most logical one is the creation of two states, Israel and Palestine, but that the Palestinian state be East Jerusalem, all of the West Bank, and Gaza, with a connector between Gaza and the West Bank. That's the agreed upon international consensus. But Israel does not allow that, in fact, actively engages against it, and is basically trying to weaken Palestinians to the point where they will accept some form of limited autonomy in Palestinian population areas. So Israel keeps expanding where there should be a Palestinian state in East Jerusalem, 
in the West Bank and then puts a blockade on Gaza, periodically invading it. And there's no place for a Palestinian state. So the way out is two states. Now, many people in the world uh, believe now that Israel has settled so much of Jerusalem and the West Bank that there isn't any possibility for two states. So more and more people, including some Jews, are calling for one state, Israel-Palestine, where Jews and Palestinians live together in a democratic, equal society without a preference for Jew or Palestinian. So the argument is basically two states or one state, but the reality is that Palestinians are trying to accomplish even this, a limited autonomy, and and that's not happening. Now, Mark, as you think of readers getting to the end of Future of the Prophetic, if they would only walk away with one or two things from the book, what are those things that you hope that they will remember as they go forward? Well, you know, the book will often be read in terms of Israel-Palestine in the present-day conflict, and that's certainly part of the book and part of my work. But I think the most important part of the book, at least for me, is uh, my take on the biblical witness, which is uh, different than what can be found typically in either biblical scholarship today, which tends to deconstruct, 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 or the use of the Bible against others, which is also typical. So I would like people to take away from the book some of these thoughts about the biblical witness that lives on in Jews today, and what that is or could be. And of course, the central aspect of the book is the prophetic. Seen through Israel-Palestine now, but the prophetic, of course, is the center of the indigenous of what it means to be Jewish, and that would be the central theme of the book. But the third theme would be that the prophetic has spread around the world through Christianity and Islam, and as it atrophies within parts of the Jewish community, it is being represented to Jews as something for us to reconsider. That is, some Christians especially, and some Muslims and secular folks as well, are saying, wait a minute, you are the primal root of the prophetic. Where are you? What are you doing? Even in terms of the Holocaust, is this the lesson that you take from the Holocaust? To bomb others into oblivion? And I think the Gaza war here is now going to refocus this question. And also, it's an opportunity for Jews to think again. Is this who we want to be? Well, that's very helpful. Thank you for sharing that. Let me close with a, a kind of a two-part question on audience. I'd be curious to hear, as you were writing the book, who was the audience that you had in mind? And then also, uh, another part of that question, when it comes to using Future of the Prophetic in the classroom, what sort of classes do you think it might be a good fit for? Well, I don't think of an audience when I write. I'm trying to write what I believe and present it to anyone who is interested in these views. Now, that would be Jews, Christians, Muslims, secular people. It seems to me that a lot of people from diverse backgrounds are interested in what does it mean to be Jewish. I mean, this is one of the oldest questions in history, and it's also quite alive, and especially Israel-Palestine focuses it, and the Holocaust, it focuses this question, what does it mean to be Jewish? So anyone who's interested in that question, I hope this, uh, my writing would lead to more reflection on it. And in terms of classroom, I mean, if people in classrooms are going to read real books, rather than manufactured books for classroom use, that is textbooks. If we want to go deeper into these questions than snippets, uh, kind of uh, textbook snippets, that would be something that students uh, might actually appreciate. Of course, teachers have to have the courage. Are they going to present students with ideas that might challenge them, might challenge the Jewish communities? basic assertion about what it means to be Jewish, and also lift up controversial questions about Palestinians. The academic world uh, is uh, one that is uh, drowning in fear and self-censors itself. So the real question uh, in terms of classroom use is, are we going to break these questions that everyone in the world is asking at some level and allow students to enter those questions? Well, that's helpful. Thank you for your perspective on that. 
Mark, just want to say thanks so much for being generous with your time today. And thanks for being a part of this episode of Fortress Press Live. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for being a part of my conversation today with Mark Ellis. To view the show notes for this episode or to leave a comment, head over to fplive.fortresspress.com forward slash 009. While you're there, be sure to check out other episodes and subscribe to the show via Stitcher Radio. Until next time, this is your host, Sean Tabbitt, signing off.